Welcome to episode 149 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I speak to Nick Hayward from Hercut 100 about the 40th anniversary of their classic debut album, Pelican West. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Princess Goes about their second album, Come of Age. So check it out, and if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating, and leave a comment. Eighties new wave pop band, Hercut 100, are back to celebrate the 40th anniversary of their debut album, Pelican West, and they'll be taking their Hercut 100% live tour to the UK and Ireland. The tour will be the group's first time on the road together since releasing Pelican West in 1982. Bringing the past 40 years into the present, Hercut 100 will look to fuse the sounds of the original album, the rest of their 80s hits, as well as new music from the band. In this interview, Nick Hayward talks about all of the above and lots more. So sit back, relax and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Nick Hayward from Hercut 100. So hi Nick, welcome to the Access Noise podcast. Hello, how are you going? It's great to have you. You never age, Nick. You know, I'm just looking at you now. You, you've got oh. your hair. You look, you look like, like you, you just you, how you did back in the 80s. Bless you, Mark. <laughs> what, what's the that. secret? Um, get ill. <laughs> 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 that, that's how I got uh, my health together because I was, you know, about 10 years ago, I just got health issues. So I had to sort of diet and watch my diet and watch what I ate and and uh, try to be as healthy as I possibly could just to sleep, which was good. So my whole day now is uh, revolved around getting sl- good quality sleep. So, um, yeah. Good, good yeah, and loads of- Well, no, not so much, but just deep sleep, restful sleep. Uh, it's not so much about putting pressure on myself to get, you know, eight hours deep sleep, even though that would be amazing. Um, quality sleep, I think it's the best thing. And that's, that's down to the quality of uh, my day, which, you know, if it was like yesterday, it was full on in a rehearsal, standing in a room, singing songs you wrote 40 years ago. So, uh, <laughs> the, it's, you know, the subconscious mind is kind of like, oh, you don't normally do this. You normally potter around and, uh, yeah, you might walk by the river. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Hercut 100 are back with a reissue of your classic debut album, Pelican West, and the tour of the UK and Ireland to celebrate the album's 40th anniversary. But before we get into that, can we go back to the start? Can, can you remember the first band or artist that made you pay attention to music? Yeah, God, there was, God, there was, there was loads. But I, I looked at music and just thought it was um, impossible. You know, it was just like a thing. It was just a magical stuff that went on in the telly, just like tomorrow's world. You know, this was another world that you were not part of. But I got a glimpse of it around the area, you know, knowing that David Bowie had grown up in Beckenham was massive to everybody that that loved music because you actually did kind of think, well, he did it. He's done it. You know, and you, we used to go into his um, the pub that was his sort of laboratory, if you like, where he used to do all his early stuff, which was called the Three Tons in Beckenham. And then it became a, um, I think it's a ZZ now, <laughs> uh, how the times have changed. But, you know, it's still such a, a landmark that now even though it's a ZZ, you know, there's pictures of David Bowie up everywhere in the toilets and down the hall. And, you know, as soon as you walk in, it's like ZZ stroke David Bowie's Look, the pop laboratory, you know, where he did all these art installations and this is where he launched from. And just down from there, I also saw once Sparks walking down the high street, which just blew my head because I'd just been to see them at, up in sort of Croydon, which is Philford Halls, uh, when they had uh, um, this town it big enough for the both of us out. So I just seen Sparks and then they, here they were walking down the high street and uh, I couldn't believe it, but I found out since, because I've spoken to Russell, and they he said the reason we were walking down Beckenham High Street is because we had the same management 
as David Bowie. Yeah. Oh. So that's why it was there because you know it's. I just thought, what is it about Beckenham? There's all these um, glam pop stars walking around in the you know with platform boots on walking around that up and down the high street, you know, down the wimp past the wimpy bar, you know, mm-hmm. there they were. Um, so I kind of did think it was possible, but it wasn't till punk that it really took off. That was when it was kind of possible. You know, it had been a bit impossible and a bit of a, just a pipe dream. I mean, the early bands were just, I mean, I loved, you know, it was more to connect it with going out, though, like uh, on the level, Status Quo's first, one of their first albums I just loved. I mean, because it had Down Down, which I still think is one of the most classic pieces of rock pop music ever written. You know, it's just a, everything about it, the feel of it and the way it drives. I mean, it was a perfect Friday, Saturday night. You're just about to go out. You've got triple denim on and you've got, you know, your hair's long and it's touching down here, but you want it to get it further. And just like, you know, Rick Parfitts or Francis Rossi and, you know, you're you're going out, you're going out and um, you're going to meet some more denim and some cheesecloth and uh, platform shoes and, and things and, and bomber jackets and budgie jackets and halter necks all kind of like swaying together to all those brilliant music music from 1976. Um, and Queen, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, all these beautiful pieces of music that was going on that were just made completely from, like by wizards, by, they were, it was made, written by wizards and, and put together and made by wizards that had been honing their craft up until that point so well, you know, they they've been, Evolving since the sixties, making music and pop music, and here they were in the seventies, and it just got just so you know it was a mixture of the technical and the analog feel, and everything was just working. People were becoming masters of their craft around that time, which was which is amazing because when we finally got into music ourselves, you know we'd be working with these people that had worked on Queen, so the people that had worked on Queen records, I mean John Gallen, our engineer had worked on Night of the Opera. So he, he brought all his experience to us as a young band, 20, eager to sort of just do, replicate our heroes, really, because you know, none of us really know why we're doing this. Just do we, anything. You know, it was, a, it was a dream of most of us, all my mates. We all just wanted to be, you know, like, just on, the, on top of the pops, really. I mean, that was the dream, you know, and it just... It just never went for me. It was always there when I saw Squeeze and the undertones. You know, when I saw Fergal in, you know, in his Parker kind of thing on top of the pops, I just thought, yeah, you know, nobody's ever done that before. When I saw Squeeze on there singing about Up the Junction, I never thought it would happen with the girl from Clapham. And then when I saw Talking Heads on there and XTC and all these brilliant bands that I loved and went to see in London, it was just such an inspiring period to see, you know, there was this beautiful looking woman with an SG junior guitar and a leather jacket and sort of long sort of hair like Susie Quattro, but black, you know, and that was Chrissy Hind. And suddenly you just thought, Oh yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not a female, but if I was, I'd look like that. That's, that's a fantastic. <laughs> so there was all these looks going on all the time. And you were just thinking, I wonder what I'm going to look, look like, because I can't look like any of these, but I just want to find my own style. So when, when we got together, because, you know, we were just rehearsing and rehearsing, you know. First off, we, we all rehearse in, in our bedrooms alone kind of thing. And then you you meet up, you meet with guys. I mean, I'm at, I'm at Graham outside the Wimpy in Beckenham High Street in about 1978, I think it was. 70, I think it was. Don't, might, might have been 77. I'll have to, I'll have to liaise on that one. Um, but it was... Uh, it was just that moment. He was dressed in full clash, you know, full punk kind of thing. And uh, he was going out with my my ex girlfriend, uh, who had left me for one of Graham's punk mates, kind of thing. Then moved to Graham, and then we met, and we we just got on really well because people in the area, you kind know, of into music, all kind of clung together. So I I knew I knew that Graham played guitar, so it was just like you know, and Les and I were already to get together because. Heard, we heard through the grapevine, you know, he heard about a guitarist, singer, guy, guy who writes songs, and, and I'd heard about the best bass player in the area, you know, Les Neens. 
So we all met and uh, we're all next in a garage playing together and different names, going to rehearsal studios all over London, keep trying to get gigs, play gigs. I think it was New Wave and then Scar came along, then Mod. So we just became all these things, you know, we're just evolving and evolving. But um, I suppose just like an engineer or anybody in a job, you just, you're getting better at your craft. So, um, and the music was just all our influences all coming together as a melting pot. You know, Graham brought, brought the clash to the, to the table. Les bought Shalimar and his funk roots, you know, and I bought Talking Heads and Earth, Wind and Fire. And, but we all appreciated that music together. So we'd all kind of listen to something like Earth, Wind and Fire and go, well, we obviously can't play like that, but imagine, imagine being, imagine sound, imagine being able to and imagine that. And, but it was still a dream when we were in, you know, in, in the seventies kind of thing. But the, more accomplished we got and into the eighties and then it was became more possible and we were, and then when we met Blair, who was actually American from Memphis, had played with the Jacksons and played with Rufus Thomas and Stax artists and things and learnt in the studio in econom- economy and in drumming. But it was was one of the I think it was probably the best play, uh, best drummer, definitely in the country at that time. Definitely the whole of the UK. At that time, I don't think that there was anyone like Blair at all. I mean, he just, and we were lucky enough to just meet him. And he was lucky enough to say yes when Les and I said, do you want to join? And that was it. It was like we suddenly became, it's possible to now to be, to be, to give, be as solid as the things we aspired to, like calling the gang and Earth, Wind and Fire or anything. And so it took, started to go to another level. So it was building all the time. The dream was becoming possible. What was your ambitions for the band in the beginning? Once you got together and you had the right band, mm. what, what were you aiming for? Uh, to be, I just supposed to emulate our heroes, really, to be, to make music that really moved you. If it, you know, because you've been so moved by music at that, that particular time, so much, so blown away all the time. I mean, I was, personally, I was just getting c- continually b- blown away by new acts. You know, the first time I saw, XTC was, you know, I saw a picture in the New Musical, New Musical Express. And it was just Andy Partridge's hair, I think. It was just like, oh, that's a great side parting. I really like that parting, you know, the way it's down a bit and just like a bit of an accountant and it's over to one side. I really like that. And um, then they had a keyboard uh, and it said dogs breathing on the side of the keyboard. And it, so it's details like that that you just go, I love that band. They're called XTC. I don't know why. They've got a song called Neon Shuffle and Science Fiction. Don't know why. What's that all about? Dogs breathing. Uh, and it sounds like people scratching each other's backs and it, on the sound of it. And it's like, a, what is this? And it sounds like it's plugged into electricity and it's just alive. And you, you can't believe you're hearing this. And then I went to see them live and they just, they just were so the tightest band I've ever seen at that, up until that point. They were so, they all stopped in unison. Um, and it was just mesmerising to see the musicians on stage so wired and playing so tightly together. That was so impressive. That was a massive influence on, on us as a, as a band, you know, something we aspired to, to be, to do that stuff. You know, we spent so many rehearsals just trying to go, um, and that was why when Blair came along, we were able to go. And it's like, wow, this is this is cool, you know. So that's that's really what it was. We just wanted to be just to be make music that that had an effect on. People like us, you know, that's what it had done. So it was like, just be that. But you could never imagine that you could do that, but you just, you just do it. And then, and then time has revealed that that has influenced people. And so the proof is in the pudding. And that's why when you do get somebody come up to you and say, you know, uh, Pelican West is my pet sounds, you just go, wow. 
okay, you know, thank you. That's an honor. That's amazing because, and you just think as a band, you have, you've done that, you know, you've achieved that. And so really the rest is, yes, it's great going on top of the pops. Yes, they're great things, all that stuff and et cetera, et cetera. But it's not, it's not as, you don't feel as grateful as when you get somebody, some guy and it's, and somebody who's brave enough to sort of like say that, you know, to actually sort of frit because it's real, you know, when it's real, you know, it's not just somebody saying it. They've been brave enough to come up to you and say that, uh, to, and to share that with you. And it's real when that's happened. Cause I, I know, cause I have the same feeling with albums, you know, they, you cling to them, you play them and you play them and you play them and you know, every detail about them. And they take you off to another place when you listen to them. You know, you've left the mundane world that's pretty dull or whatever. I mean, whatever it is now, it was different then. It was just, it was almost kind of late 70s, early 80s. It was it was grim outside of, how, you know, outside of your imagination. You know, it seemed that pretty real what was going on in, you know, and sort of almost black and white uh the the world because it was you know still still the still kind of black, black and white tvs you know <laughs> so and it was a bit well, well it wasn't our family well pelican west was the complete opposite it was a groundbreaking album it was upbeat you know it's it's it, it didn't sound like anything else and and it still sounds fantastic today and you've just reissued uh with the four cd to celebrate the 40th anniversary can mm. you believe it's been 40 years i mean what what can you looking back at that dark time what can you remember about writing and recording the album? Well, you know, been, we've been actually reminded of a lot of the recording process. Now we're spending so much time together. I mean, I think even now on this time we've got back together, we've got back together with longer than we did then. So, but with Les Graham and I, it's always there because we've got the friendship that goes back deep into the roots of the band. You know, we've been, we were a mod band. You know, we're a punk band, um, we're aspiring power pop band at one point. We were so many things. So we've we've got that to look up. So we've known each other as friends and we've got that friendship. And that's why we've said that that friendship is now for life. We're just going to have to know each other for life. And that's that, you know. So it's really, it's really nice. It's taken the pressure off everything, you know. Uh, it's, it's lovely. But the, the recording process was just so quick. Um, and I think that's down to when you've got Blair Cunningham in a band. <laughs> and also, um, I, mean, I think we did the backing tracks in Les Graham and I we sat with, we just sat around Blair, who was like the wellspring. And we were like, you know, water bearers around him. And so we're like drinking from him, you know, so, and it was Bob and John Gallen and Mark Durney just capturing it up in that glass, the sort of like a fish tank, it looked like, in the because it was still a bit the 70s, the, the Roundhouse Recording Studios then. It had a kind of like um, sort of round circle, like a fish tank, it looked like. Um, so we'd be playing, looking up into the fish tank and seeing um, Bob who had lots of yellow hair. So that's why we called him Bobby Yellow Sergeant. And he was the guy who just whipped us into shape. You know, he'd done it with the beat. And we couldn't believe we were working with him anyway because he'd made Mirror in the Bathroom, you know. And to us, it was just kind of, oh, my God. If he makes anything close to Mirror in the Bathroom with us, you know, we just thought we just had, I mean, we didn't think Love Plus One was, I mean, it was just a good live song and, Fair bit shirts used to go down live, but we never thought these were singles like Mirror in the Bathroom or Best Friend or any of this stuff. But Bob, and, you know, these were wizards at the top of their game and in the top of the game studio at the moment. I mean, I think uh, Motorhead and Uriah Heap were next door recording because it was a bit of a, it was a rock label called Bronze Records. And uh, so uh, his job was to just make a sparkling, thing you know proper pop single so so the process was that we just all did our bits we all just did our bits and it was all gathered and put together like a like a mockingbird bob was like a mockingbird it was gathering it all together 
to then say to Arista Records, who had just signed these young hopefuls, you know, this is it. Here we are. Here's the thing you need to carry on, to go to the next stage, whatever it was. So it just meant it was very easy, exciting, and everybody was just doing their best all, all over the place. I mean, you know, Phil just turned into, you know, he was living his Tower of Power dream, you know, and, and Earth, Wind & Fire, you know, because imagine if you grew up a saxophone player, that's where his heart was, and that's where his mind was, you know, in... You know, so, um, and that was where Mark's head was in Latin American percussion, where he would go, you know, he would think... So he bought bought that. I mean, I'd, I still to this day have not met it, not met a percussionist as good as Mark. So um, we were just doing, making it up as we went along. You know, sometimes they turn around to me and sort of like, you know, you got a new one, and I, I just I had I, I I'd been fiddling on the um, fiddling in my bedroom at the ski club where where we lived at that time and. Snow girl just playing dun, 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 snow girl, snowy oh yo. And so you'd play that and Blair and suddenly so you'd that's a new one. And having Blair there, he would just okay, just do it. He had that kind of American spirit. So you'd just be like, Are you got a new song? Okay, just play it. You know, no kind of let's work out the charts or this or that. It was just kind of like play it. You know, so that was that that's the that's the beauty of a band. You just, everybody plays their parts and it gets put together really nice and quickly, like a, like a garment, you know, in a, in a, in a room with where lots of people are all working on it together. And suddenly there you have it made. And I suppose you've got so many tailors all, all in the studio, all to working together. And so you, to get this, this garment, and you don't know what the garment is really at that time. You're aspiring to probably like, I don't know, the best suits you've ever made or something, or whatever it is, whatever purpose you've you've got. I don't know, maybe it's a deep sea diving outfit, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, was, I was probably thinking that because I was thinking, I don't know whether Black Sea was out yet. I think it was. The XTC album with Towers of London on the things. But, but there are so many brilliant records being made there. So I'll tell you what. You know, it was just literally just to to be able to make an album was an honour. Well, Pelican West, it was a new UK top ten for three months, ten weeks of which were in the top five, mm-hmm. and you and it was only capped off number one by Barbara Streisand of all people with love songs. You mentioned Top of the Pops, and the band yeah. first appeared in Top of the Pops with your debut single, Favorite Church Boy Meets Girl, which reached number four. What memories do you have of being on Top of the Pops? What was it like being there as a band for the first time? Well, we turned up in our little white van, which we called a Panda Mobile, uh, pulled in, and we expected it to, to walk in and it to be top of the pops, you know, lights everywhere and glitter and dry ice and um, crowds, big crowds of people, and we walked in to this. It felt like a bit of an aircraft hangar, freezing, empty, dark, you know, and we thought, oh, so we, it was freezing at that, that day anyway. And uh, I think it was November. And um, we all had jumpers on and we piled on stage to do the re- the run through. And there's no one there. There's just cameras. And I remember the guy saying, just follow the orange light. That orange light that comes, comes on, so it comes on this camera and then it comes on that. And so you're sort of like, OK, I've never done this before, but all right. So if you're singing and then you look there and you look there and. I thought, oh, okay, right. But we couldn't, it was it was okay at first because we thought, is this it? So I think that helped us calm our nerves because if you can imagine, this had been the dream for us, you know, living together, Les Graham and I, in a flat above a flower shop, Gloucester Road, dreaming of being on Top of the Pots, watching Top of the Pots together, oh, who's on this week and stuff, and here we were. So we couldn't believe it was actually happening. So we couldn't stop smiling at each other. And um, we did the run through. And then gradually the lights come on. And then gradually the people come in. And then gradually 
the directors hovering around going, darling, lights over here, one on Leslie, one on Leslie, you know. And then we go, no, we're okay, we're, we know where we are now, you know, this is top of the pops, okay, let's go. And um, it was Brian, our publisher at the time, who's a larger than life character with a huge cigar. And he said, uh, keep the jumpers on, guys, you look great. And he said, are you keeping them on? We went, no, no, we're going to, you know, just because it's cold. So that was it. We uh, we kept them on. And just as the camera was coming down, I remember um, that pinched me sort of in that moment. Uh, and somebody said, oh, there's just some, I don't know how many million people are watching this. Just relax. I think he, I think he liked saying that to the people that were on their first time. You know, there's like, let's say 50 million people here. Just <laughs> relax, sunshine, you know. <laughs> And it just made, made me think, oh, my Lord, oh, God, what light? Orange? What's that orange light? Okay, follow that. But that wasn't the effect that I noticed. It was mainly the next day because it, it didn't go out live then. I think it was recorded on a Wednesday and then it was out on Thursday. So we were on tour and we played in Hicks Cinderella's and we were in – I was filling up with petrol and um, standing there filling up and the guy next – was next to us was filling up with petrol and he looked at me and that was the first time somebody's ever looked at you and they kind of went that's them that's them i saw them on top of the pops last night oh my god that's it um and we sort of oh god that oh it was first recognized ever like that um and then we it was just weird it was so weird it and then starts in a, a strange of change of events in your life from that it's like things aren't ever really the same as they were in those days before before that yeah so that was the, the effects of it were quite huge can you remember what other bands were on the show with you that night um yeah um the the furies i remember uh the, strangely uh, they were on there <laughs> uh, and Olivia Newton-John, Rod Stewart, yeah, they're, they're, they're the main ones that come to mind. And I think the following week we, there was Call in the Game, and that's when uh, they came into our dressing room and said, where's Benji? And they all knew Blair. You know, where's little Benji? <laughs> <laughs> they like, man, he, you know, there's all slaps, and we were like so, oh. I mean, Les couldn't breathe. He was so impressed, you know. <laughs> like wow yeah and you followed on with more hits love plus one fantastic brilliant brilliant song and my favorite has to be fantastic day you know and it's a fan favorite as well can you tell me the story behind that track and what what does it mean to you personally now looking back do you know it's funny but i still really like playing fantastic day it's really weird i, th I keep thinking when am i going to get bored of this it was um yeah it was just for me that goes right back to the 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 beginning you know that was like okay got to learn to sing and play at the same time right that's the goal so got into my bedroom head i had a pair of headphones my dad's um hi-fi headphones that i borrowed which he would like, he would kill me but you know so i used to sneak in there during the day and, and get them and then there's a curly lead into a little vox amplifier practice amp this big and then I had a makeshift, makeshift microphone where it was a Sanyo, little Sanyo mic, which you used to record. You know, remember those early things on the tape recorders that used to, cassette tape recorder, little yeah. portable, like that. And I'd, I'd put it on top of a, like this pole and uh, sellotaped it on there. And um, that was my microphone. And uh, just stood there thinking, what does David Byrne do? You know, he looks all kind of, He's got his guitar quite high, isn't he? You know, because I'd seen them on the um, Old Royce Test and it was just, oh, he had a little a sunburst, semi-acoustic guitar, sunburst, 12-string, and I just thought, oh, yeah. And he, he actually had one of these on, done up like this. Yeah, polo kind of polo. thing. Yeah, and so did Tina Weymouth, and I just thought they looked so preppy. It was just at that particular point, I was just kind of so impressed by the whole preppy thing that was going on i really liked this other band called the feelies as well at that time just because of the way they looked um 
and then just kept singing. And I didn't know what I was singing, but I was just singing. I knew three chords, D, C, G. So I just kept singing over them, playing and fan- fantastic, fantastic day. Just kept coming out and gradually that was the song. So every time, and that's why I think it's so positive, the chorus. And that's why I enjoy still, I still enjoy singing it because, you know, at the end of the day, it's a fantastic day. I mean, even though it's, there's stuff that goes on, it's like, you know, it's like just fantastic to sort of like still be here, really. I mean, we're all, as long as you're, as long as you're singing, it's fantastic then, isn't it? You know, you're still here. Um, so it's just evolved, that word, fantastic day. And, um, and, it, and it got s- sunk away. I mean, it just got left, that song, in our previous bands. But when we're doing the showcase, just before we signed to Arista, they were still a little bit kind of, yeah, I know there's a big, huge buzz about this band, but have they got any, like, big pop songs? And they were in the, they were in the showcase, and they, they said, have you got any other ones? And we just, you know, because we, we, we'd been playing funk, funky along, and um, Les said, what about Fantastic Day, you know, that old old one? And we sort of looked at each other thought, oh, this, we played it. And they just, we saw them all looking at each other, like, you know. <laughs> and that was it. That was the sealer. That was like, so that song's been kind of a, a fantastic thing. I mean, thing. It's like, where is, where is it from? It's from the desire to make music, you know, to just the dream. That's what it is. It's, it's the desire to live that that dream, and it, you know, I suppose even though I go through times when I just want to not do it, as way everybody does, everybody doesn't want to do the thing that they do a lot of the time. Um, the dream never dies. It's just always there, you know, and just you just got to keep turning up for it. So I learned that one finally, and that's good. It's like just, you know. Don't believe your mind, just keep turning up. Mm. Have a little moan and then move on. The band's music was known for its upbeat and colourful style. I mean, you designed, you designed the artwork for the record sleeves. So, so how did the fashion and aesthetics of the 80s influence the band's image and music? Um, it did and it didn't because we didn't sound, because we were going along a certain thread and it didn't seem to be the thread that was going along because there was the kind of new romantic synth pop stuff that was more popular than the Brit funk thing that was going on that we the, that we were on the thread. That was that. It was a kind of little cultural wave that was coming over from the other cultural wave. It was it was related to new romantic, but it wasn't new romantic. So therefore, we weren't we we're more high street than new romantic. We just we just focused on who we who we were, which was probably more. Yeah, I mean, if you've grown up in Beckenham, you really in South London and, and and stuff, you know that it's not. There's nothing um, new, romantic, and glam about that area. It's it's quite. Yeah, it, and especially then, it was quite hard. It was quite tough ish. It was that suburban. It was. It was the Buddha of suburbia. You know, it was. I mean, I grew up surrounded by skinheads in south london you know because i first lived in brixton and tulls hill and things in the 70s that was just full-on fights with, between skinheads uh and you know there, there was just that's what it was so we, we, I, th- I suppose glam was the art uh, the and the opposite of that going on there was you've got people fighting each other and doing all this stuff and then you've got sort of glam you know people dressing up painting stars on their face and and, and kind of living out the opposite. It's, it's very, very strange that that happens in, in the cultures when there's kind of tough and hard. It's the bittersweet, maybe the duality of life that's reflecting back. Because I think it was a tough period and, you know, you've got the Falklands War and you've got lots of stuff going on. And so there was, it was in the air. It was, it was kind of like the optimism was starting to change. The answer to this bleakness was optimism and and therefore, it's getting a little bit more colourful around about 82. And um, it, 
definitely felt that way, that we're all fed up with just being, we all wanted to just dance, you know? And so I think that's what the new romantic thing started to come out of, really, how, how bleak it was politically as well. So that's why there was, it felt like there was a change coming. I mean, we, we didn't, none of us realised what was going to happen in, in the 80s, but it was, you know, it was a, a strange, strange period, but, but it definitely, that shift between 70s and 80s, it was so profound, you know, um, and the music just reflected that in both the opposite and, you know, so it definitely had an influence, but production wise, I think we were still in the seventies. That's, you know, working with Bob, you know, cause we liked the beat and that kind of, you know, that's kind of earthy records. And so we weren't leaning, we didn't have a, like a new romantic producer or anything. So had we have continued, maybe that would have happened. But then again, I worked with Jeff Emmerich, who was more sixties, you know, he'd made everything from Penny Lane right through with the Beatles. So I was aspiring there and then and thinking with Elvis Costello because he just made Imperial Bedroom. And that was a vast sound. So I felt like with Imperial Bedroom and ABC and Pale Fountains and then things were becoming a bit more grander at that particular point and strings were starting to come in and more more statements. It was getting it was getting less about less about the dance and the funk at that particular point and more about landscapes. I mean, China crisis with, with Christian was, a, you know, I remember hearing that and just thinking what a beautiful piece of music. And the fact that that was in the charts as well, made it, made it part of the culture, the cultural wave that was of change, you know, suddenly you got these beautiful records with soprano sax going on and clarinets and things. And just, it was starting to get more colorful, I suppose, to, to sort of flourish and blossom, you know, things were brightening up. They definitely were, because I remember, you know, Haircut 100 had a comic strip in Look In magazine, and you were going to have your own TV sitcom. Um, why did that not happen? Because that, that would have been amazing. Uh, it, would have been, it would have been amazing. It, it really would. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, what can we do? It didn't, it didn't happen, but you'd love to go back in a time machine and make it all happen as, as it should have done. But, um, yeah, we we met um, we met up with somebody. We were writing the TV series, and you know it was going to be filmed in Malta. You know, you know, and it's it's really strange because you know many many years later, this was going to be filmed in a marina in Malta. And uh, about five years ago, my wife and I found ourselves living in a marina, and um, two boats along from where we were. There was this sort of houseboat. There was this boat called West Pelican. And it was just that thing oh. of every morning I would come out of uh, this little the sort of ramshackle boat that, that we'd, we were living on because we just rented there in this marina. And it was, it was, in, it was in Key West, so it was, it was like the arty area of Key West where all the sort of like musicians and art, artists lived. And because um, it's cheaper to be able to live there because I mean, Key West is like high rolling, you know, there's huge you know houses and things it's kind of um colonial houses that have just been maxed out and they look amazing and they're um fantastic place i don't know if you know it it's it's quite something it's just in the middle of the middle of the the ocean you know and you 90 miles from cuba boiling wow. place but just you know Ernest hemingway had this house there next to a lighthouse and it's just filled with cats <laughs> but you know we so wanted to get married in his garden we, 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 we didn't but but you know it's that thing of every day coming out and sort of like going you know am I, am I now living that that idea kind of thing about you know living in a marina because we both didn't know why we we're doing it it was like so strange it was just we're staying at friends and making an album out there and things no that's funny life life is just funny you know, it's continually kind of something you might have um, just thought was a dream and then it happens. And then when it happens, you think, well, was it a dream or was it just um, it was going to happen anyway? Or did I make it happen? It's, it's, it's strange, you know. You put yeah. it under the universe. The existential question, you know, did I make it yeah. happen 
or was it going to happen anyway and I just got a glimpse into the future? <laughs> or is there any t- such thing as time? Is there such thing? Or is it just all, you know... All no, just we're ha- going deep. Yeah, amazing. That That's a whole other interview. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the deluxe edition of Pelican West, which was released uh, at the start of this year, features demos from your unfinished second album. Now, you left before it was finished, so what happened around that time? Why did you choose to leave, and why was the album left unfinished? Well, I suppose it's that difficult second album. I mean, I I, I wanted us to to work with Jeff Emmerich. That was it. I wanted the second album to sound more grand, and it wasn't sounding grand. I mean, I don't know if you can hear it, but it sounds... It doesn't, it doesn't sound, I think it really works working at the Roundhouse, but we, we've moved to the manor, but it wasn't to be, to have that sound of like English Settlement, which was our favourite album at the moment. Les was playing it to death on the coach and things like that. But I think to sound like English Settlement, you've got to probably have Hugh Padgham, uh, who was, I think, working on that. And you've you've got to... BXTC, probably. I mean, it's that thing that just they had their team and they sounded the way they did because they did. But it didn't. The, it wasn't sounding as good. Now, well, I wasn't happy with the sound, but I seem to be the only one that wasn't happy with the sounds uh, at that particular point. Um, so I thought we should go to air and uh, finish off the album, but that's where the it was like starting to separate, where everybody's got to be on the same page. So that's when it was like, they stayed at the round, went back to the roundhouse. I didn't want to go back to the roundhouse. Um, and they were with Bob finishing off the album at the roundhouse. And then I was trying to finish it with uh, air. And that's where that. And so that's where, you know, I wanted the, the follow up to be to sound like North of a Miracle did. That's how I wanted, that's what it was. That was the go- that was the goal, the dream. But I'd lost I'd lost the leadership role of the band by that time. So, yeah. So that's that's just that's what happened. But it's you know not what we well, not what we wanted to happen <laughs> in hindsight. So that's why there's loads of unfinished stuff around. So how did you feel when the band carried on and released the second and final album, Paint and Paint, in 1984? How did you feel when you heard that? You know, um, well, you know, when, I mean, at the time I just did, just, um, it was like a Spinal Tap thing, you know, I wanted, it was, it was our band, you know, Les Graham and I's band. So to see Mark leading it was awful. That was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's, what happened? Do you ever wonder what the band might have achieved if you'd stayed together and recorded more albums? All the time, yeah. It's a, been a, a constant thought, you know, what if for all of us, you know, Les Graham and I, you know, we, um, but we, we've, we haven't invented the time machine yet. We'd, we'd love to once, once <laughs> we do, we could definitely go back. But, uh, the thing is, there's something about this. This period, this time right now with Les Graham and I, it's never been like this. It's like it's a timeless realm now where we don't want to have time machines and we don't feel like we need them because we're very happy who we are now. And when we got together this time, some really kind of good karma has happened. You know, we, we got asked to do the BBC piano room, which We've got back together before, you know, because we can get back together because Les Graham and I are great mates, rock solid uh, now. Here we are. and um, But it's, it's staying together. It's a really, really hard, so we haven't had a manager. And a uh, brilliant management company who specialise in bands just was saw the piano lounge and stuff and saw that they were it was getting back. So... One thing led to another, you know, Piano Lounge asked you to go on there, which was a bit of a, wow, that's amazing. And that's probably just because I talked to one of the guys, I said, how did we get this gig? <laughs> how did this happen? You know, And uh, the guy said, oh, I just really saw that you were back together and thought, wouldn't it be great to have Haircut 100 on? So we did. So I thought, wow, that's, that's 
that's lucky. That's a really nice, lovely thing. And then Melvin and Martin Hall, uh, Melvin Tubb and Martin Hall, they they saw it. So then they managed the Mannix and Wet Leg and stuff. And so and Delamitri, so they, they know what they're doing with bands. So they said, can we help? So we just said, yes. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so well, it was it was a great version of Harry Styles as it was that you did on the piano room. Oh, Fantastic. I'll, I'll tell the guys. Thank you. Brilliant song. That's such a good song. Brilliant song. Really good. I love singing that song. So you're back on the 15th date UK tour through October and November. Mm-hmm. And you said, I read that you said, we're coming back with a tour to beat all tours this autumn and we can't wait. So what can people expect from the shows? Um, all the enthusiasm from the band. I mean, I just we just finished rehearsals yesterday and it was like, oh my God, this is going like the clappers. This is so good. This is going to be really, really good. It's exhausting. It's exhausting, <laughs> but it's it's really good. It so takes off. It's just percolated pop funk. You know, it really is uh, all of Pelican West, pretty much. Um, bits of Junction Box, I think, and it's like at the moment we were playing like three new ones, I think, as well. Because I mean, the new ones—that's the difference this time. The new ones have just slotted in really, really easily, and and Les Graham and I just—we don't hark back to the past now. It's really weird. It's like we're just living. It's just like this has always been the past. It was the past. It was the present then. When it happens, and it's the present now, and it always was, always w- is, and always will be. So we're just more present these days together. So, you know, it would only be a laugh that we're talking about the past, you know, or some purpose. But actually, where we are is right now doing it and loving the fact that we have management, uh, we're doing BBC, um, we're touring. Like, wow. So we're just really grateful, um, loving it and going, you know, uh, management came down to the rehearsal yesterday and said they were talking about some dates in America, which we just go, we could only dream about because we haven't been back to America since too. Um, First time playing in Ireland ever. Yeah. And then it's like, wow, it's all the things that we wanted to have happen last time are now happening. So it's never too late, Mark, to... To, to actually, you know, kind of do the things that we didn't do. It's just that it's a lot later, that's all. We just maybe just mm-hmm. took a long, long time to grow up or something. I don't know. But it's just lovely. And it's so lovely to be around each other. It really is. You know, having, having your best mates back is just, you know, oh, it's such a, it's a heartwarming and like life-affirming. Yeah. Well, everything happens for a reason, Nick, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. I read that you have a new album's worth of material that's been written. Is that yeah. right? Is that right? Well, well the material is um, it's just choosing the right ones for the band, and that seems to be a natural process with this. Like, you know, it, I don't know how it gets chosen, but. It's like when we, you know, Les Graham and I do the set, we sit around a coffee table in the same way we sat around a coffee table in 1979 or something, or no, 1980 actually, and come up with a name. Same thing, it's always done with the three-pronged fork that digs into the hay bale, you know, it's, it's good. And then we, you know, we're the farmers that go and meet up with, you know, Blair, and then suddenly it's just this whole, oh, it's just an amazing thing. Yeah, I love this band. It's so good. It's like a real treat being in a band at this age as well. It's like, wow, that's an astonishing. I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> you know, I never saw it coming. There's something like very easy. You know, I'm giving Les a lift to the studio every day, and we're just chatting away about just, just like, you know, like we've been chatting away in his Volkswagen in 1977, going to going down the shops. You know, it's lovely. And here we are just off to rehearsals to do a tour. It's a bit like, I mean, we have jokes and said, why didn't we do this? Why, why didn't we just carry on doing this? We could have been just doing this for the last 40 years. It's just so silly. And that's, that's it, really. It's nothing deep. It's just like silly. 
and that's it. So, but can't change the past, can change the present, and then the the future, you know, is uh, whatever it is. I read that you're writing your memoirs. Is that right? And and when will that be coming out? Trying to, Mark. It's like, um, yeah, uh, yeah, that would be good. It's um. It's good. I enjoy writing I, when I get going. And I'm, as you can tell, I love, I love a natter. You know, I've, I've always loved a bit of a natter. I, I've always been of a chatterbox. So um, it's that thing, a process of getting it down. Because normally when I write, I, I try to get it into you know, a lyric form. When I start writing now, like if I write something here, I look to be rhyming it or put in some kind of form, poet poetry, form their lyric form so that was the writing so to work in actual memoir autobiography memories recalling um it's a, it's a completely different approach but i have got into it and when i get flowing i feel like i'm in a flow state with the writing it's like ah that's good because then you're just it's you're being written as opposed to trying to write you know that's not a good place because i know what that's like when you're trying to write a song lyric like that and you're sat there and you're going, you know, you know, and it's not till you actually let go that then it just appears. And then that's the, that's, I've always found the creative process, how it goes. So, um, so it's getting done. It's just, it's quite, you know, cause there's I mean, 62 years to write about now. It's like, you know, it was, I should have done this years ago. <laughs> but, but 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 I suppose when, now that you're back with the band, I'm sure there are sharing stories where you you probably forgot about that you could maybe include as well. Yeah, and it's all a bit like it's got a happy ending now, you know. Whereas a, a memoir, I don't know, beforehand would have been like, oh, and our band never got back together, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Now it's just a really it's, it's just lovely. If people want to understand your music, what are the five songs they should listen to? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think of of Pelican West. I mean, you know, the the singles do poke out, but then, but then there's songs like Milk Film that that show that the the band were going off in kind of like what is that area, um, and calling Captain Autumn and King Size. I mean, I think King Size should have been a probably been the fourth single rather than Nobody's Fall, but. In those days, you didn't do four singles so much. You just did three off an album. But I think King Size should have definitely been, because I think that incorporates the whole story at that particular time. All the influences were right there. Um, Personally, the song for me that I've written is Kite. I'd, I'd, I'd put that in there if it was just going into some kind of capsule or something. Uh Flask, maybe a flask to take to work to eat with some sandwiches, you know. Uh, I'll put a bite in there. Um, yeah, but all the fantastic day, kite, king size, love plus one. I mean, I still enjoy playing love plus one, you know. And just and every time I hear those marimbas, I think of Bob Sargent because he was desperate to get marimbas on our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> He was always up to Marimba, you know. It's a bit like, do you want Marimba's on this? Like, oh, well, I don't have Marimba's on anything. <laughs> Just a few more, Nick. I like to ask my guests the following questions. If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? I think playing in the country club in LA and Ralph Ravenscroft from Baker Street came up to blow with us. And uh, it was a little, little club kind of jazz-ish club and everything seemed perfect in the world at that particular point it was like the dream was so being lived and here was now walking around london during punk i think baker street was the record i was walking up baker street i used to deliver to gray's advertising i think it was up and up there because i was a commercial artist delivering to other agencies and commercial art companies and Baker Street was everywhere, you know, and it was such a profound song, you know, through punk, there was all these, this great other songs going on that are all the guilty pleasures now, but 
No. At the time, they were just, you know, all this Mr. Blue Sky was going on and Baker Street was going on. And they were all the supposedly the things that punk was supposedly coming to replace, which it supposedly did in youth culture. But everybody now who was into punk is all going, oh, my favourite record was Baker Street. You know, that's <laughs> like... <laughs> so, but we were more open about it, like, um, because we, there was... Sort of, brass was such a big part of Haircut 100. So, and the respect for brass players in, in general. I mean, I'd, you know, my father couldn't believe that his son was had a brass section in his band because he was into big band and he'd taken me to see Count Basie and Stan Kenton and all these bands and stuff. So he was probably just thinking that influence really did get in with, with Nick. Um, so to then be in LA and in this world where you saw lots of people from other bands and music and stuff, and then it's just, hey, you know, there's this dude coming along with hair, all big hair, kind of, you know, can I come and blow with you? You know, and suddenly so you got like, Guy <laughs> playing a fantastic day, and you're singing, and it's such a, it was a woody around this club, the country club. It was in a brilliant area as well, and that's an amazing gig, an amazing, amazing time. Uh, it was hot, you know. Don't you didn't get we didn't know heat in, you know, coming from Beckenham. You had a few summers in 1976 and 77, and a few hot nights. You know what it's like, but. You don't really know heat, but there you are in LA and it's it's hot and you're playing a hot, sweaty club with that guy. My God, I can't believe I'm on stage. Why would he want to play with us? We're just some guys from Beckenham, you know, and you, you had to keep raising your game because you had to keep thinking, well, no, we're not just some guys with record, you know. Now we're kind of, you know, we're in LA and he's wanting to play with us. Wow, that's amazing. So I think that was a, a moment. And did you get did you get him to play the bigger street riff? Um, I don't think he did. No, um, that would have that would have been brilliant, wouldn't it? But it may yeah. maybe been there. Maybe that was his, his thing. But uh, love to have that. I don't think it was recorded. It would have been amazing to get that to hear that now. You know, because you're starting to hear things. I mean, I've, I've I'm starting to hear things from early gigs that we played at the Wellington Waterloo when we were a mod band, and I. I I've heard those recordings now and they just go, wow, you can really hear where we were starting to evolve, even just back then. It's amazing. Yeah. So uh, your memory is there, but there's something about actually hearing it and what it's like. It's an exact imprint of that time. It's like that moment. Probably why records are so strong, aren't they? Because they are imprints, really strong imprints of time you know really you know when you try and remember somebody's name that somebody's name they say you know put something strong with it a memory with it and then you'll remember you know if you say they say oh my name's john and you think it's john lennon you know and that's it you, you're never gonna not forget that name because you associate it with that person and i think that's like it's like sometimes with music it's just a pretty strong imprint of a time so to hear the actual music and the memory of certain times it's just quite some something you know I, i've been to concerts where you get overwhelmed with music when you hear it being played and it just it just kind of gets you there you know and it's an amazing thing music isn't it yeah it just triggers those memories yeah in a good way not like a trigger from you know like somebody's Somebody just uh, triggers you in that way, and it's something you don't know what it is, but subconsciously you're really upset, you know, because mm -hmm. you're consciously upset, but subconsciously upset and triggered, and that's a that's a weird one. But I suppose the music does that in the same way, but it's a good trigger. So you know, trigger happy. That's the best <laughs> way to be. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Nick, what are you most grateful for for being? able to do what you do every day breathe that's it because breathe is every breath is everything it's singing that that means it's singing that means it's ex expression and that means it's life because both my parents died of emphysema and i so, i know what the the result of no breath it is you know I've, I've i watched them pass away and so you know i'm well aware 
that it, emphysema is a big thing in my family, but that's why I don't smoke. And that's why um, I'm grateful for every breath because, you know, you get breath till the last breath. And I've seen my parents' last breath. Well, didn't see dad's. Um, my brother saw that one. I saw my mum's. Well, you know, we all saw that one. But anyway, don't want to get too down about <laughs> the death, but it's, it's, it's the breath of life and it's the, the, you know, the end of life and it's the beginning and end and, and uh, it is life. Breath is life. So it's, it's the most simple thing. But when I saw that very simple thing taken away from my mum, um, it was, it, I saw how important it, what it was. And so that's what I'm grateful for every day. And I think it's like Patrick McEwen who does the oxygen advantage stuff from Ireland. He's so into breath at the moment. He's like Mr. Breath and breathing through your nose and the importance of breathing through your nose. And I'm definitely using that for being on stage. And, you know, because the, these songs I'm singing are, are from a, a period when you're in your 20s, you know, so they're quite high key and lots of energy from that time. So at first I just thought this is this is going to be impossible. How do I can't be? I can't be 20. None of us can be 20. You can't play at that speed. What's it? But, you know, using the breath, you know, I mean, I've, I don't think I was given, I was, I was a bit like a pug dog. I was, I was given sort of like, these, these aren't too open. Or maybe wearing glasses has made them close up over the years. But it's sort of going a bit like that. So <laughs> I have to open up my nose as much as possible. So lots of tips from Patrick is really good. I really like that. And how does that affect your singing? Well, it just means that you don't breathe. So, because it's singing, you're breathing through your, and it's at the mouth. So you're getting tired out because you're going, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So it's learning to breathe between songs, just in through right. the nose, through the nose, rather than kind of <sighs> like a sort of UFC fighter that you see, you know, they, they're kind of just in between rounds. They're kind of breathing in through their mouth and breathing out because they're just exhausted because, you know, there's singing songs and then there's being a UFC fighter. So, I mean, like deep respect for that. <laughs> I still can't I look at it and I just go, man, woman, <laughs> respect, but, you know, uh, wow, you know, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, but it's a similar thing as in you, you do something, you exert a lot of power and expression and then, rest and it's about how to because I don't think I took a gasp of air in the whole year of Hair Girl 100 in 1982 so it's about learning to breathe and that's what calming and slowing down and and sleeping and breathing through the night and you know it's just um, learning how to breathe I, I just never, it took me years to learn that one I'm still trying to learn how to eat properly, you know, chew your food <laughs> other ones well, you're doing all right because you still look like you do in 1982. So. <laughs> well, that's what I said. Uh, you know, I had to do this. I was forced <laughs> to screaming into it because, you know, I, you can't eat the same. You can't eat all the curries. You can't keep drinking beer. You can't keep doing it all that because you can. Some people have got amazing genes and they just can do that and just go through. They can smoke, drink, do that, keep going. Have a really healthy life. My father-in-law does all that, gets up six o'clock for a round of golf. You know, just looks like fine. Had five heart attacks, still good to go. Um, you know, whereas I think I wouldn't sleep for a week if I had a pint of beer. You know, it's like I've got to plan these things and I've got to do it. I've got to do it by, if I drink, it's got to be like as early as possible. Maybe like lunchtime, was I 12? So it's all out of my system. And then drink like gallons of water to flush it all out before sleep. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. I've had to do that to be forced into doing that. So in the process, I think it's kept my weight down. And that gives the appearance of looking your age and looking good for your age because of health. It's not because of genes so much because I didn't look at, you know, look at a family and that wasn't the case. So I think it's just uh, lifestyle. It's been being forced to do it. Um, that's that's what it is, you know. More breath thicker. <laughs> <laughs>
So, Nick, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Anything else coming up in the media feature? Uh, no, I think we're just going to crack on with the album. We're, we're straight after the tour. We're going into the studio. We've been going into various little rehearsal studios. Um, Les Blair and and I and Graham are sending stuff to Graham down in Cornwall, and he's been sort of playing stuff and sending stuff back. And but we're all going to go in together after the tour and start um, getting this new album together. The three, the three ones we're doing are they're really good. It's it's like it's kind of a bit like I mean they sound like hits. What year? I don't know. It's not like timelessy kind of year or something. I don't know what hits are these days. I mean they're not things that what up you know, but they sound very just like Fantastic Day and Love Plus One. It's really weird. It's just like no time exists. We get together and it's just, oh, yeah, that's the sound of Hecker 100. Well, when I never. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look forward to hearing them. I look forward to hearing the album. Oh, cheers, Mark. Maybe we'll come back and have a chat about that. When yeah, it's that yeah, great. Well, Nick, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. It really, really has. Really, really enjoyed it. Likewise, Mark. Likewise. Uh, and uh, I wish you all the best with, with the shows. Cool. I'm going to try and make the Belfast show next week. So, uh, yeah, oh, it'll be great. Cool. Yeah. Okay. So, have a great day and enjoy the rehearsals. Oh, thank you. Likewise. All right.